Welcome to this week's online message from Kenmore Community Church. It's good to be with you again this week. I'm Pastor Mark Rogers. Just a few moments, we're going to be continuing our study in the book of Philippians, and uh, this week we will be uh, looking at Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. As always, I want to encourage you to have your Bible in front of you so that you can read along and follow along as we work through the passage. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks again for another day here in the Pacific Northwest. It's a, a day that's going to reach a record high. Uh, but Lord, we uh, are grateful for your presence in our lives. We thank you for the many blessings that you have given to us, most importantly of which is your presence with us. We thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, Lord. And thank you again for uh, sending Jesus to die on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. We thank you for our salvation in Christ. Thank you that it's by grace alone, through faith alone, according to the Word of God uh, alone. And Father, we uh, uh, we also thank you for the, the many material blessings that you've given to us. We recognize that everything we have comes from your hand, and we want to be good stewards of it. We do pray, Lord, uh, for uh, your help today. Uh, many of us uh, have concerns on our hearts and minds. Some of us have physical issues going on, and we need your healing touch. And so we pray again by your Spirit that you would bring your healing touch to bear in each one of our lives. Uh, others are emotionally distraught. Uh, maybe they have experienced the death of a loved one, and they need your comfort. Or just uh, the, the day in which we live, there's a lot of fear out there, Lord. And so we pray for your peace that passes understanding to guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And for those that might have material need, we know that you are Jehovah Jireh, our provider. And so we ask that you would provide for the needs of those um, that are experiencing uh, um, material uh, concerns at this time. And Father, here at Kenmore Community Church, we want to remember our families of the week. We pray for Rob and Lori McAuliffe. We pray for John and Sally McWhirter, for Jim and Karen Meisner, and for, for Sophia from our youth group. Uh, Father, we pray uh, that these folks would just have a, um, a wonderful sense of your presence with them this week, that whatever they might be going through, they, they would just uh, know that you are more than able to help them and that they would turn to you and trust in you and grow in their relationship with you and uh, that they would glorify and honor you, Lord, as we pray for each one of us. We pray for these folks that we uh, would become more and more like Jesus in our thoughts, in our attitudes, in our actions. And Father, we also want to pray for our missions focus today here at Kenmore Community Church. We pray for Kelly and Sherry Green, uh, who are uh, working in missions with uh, Plan Panta Ta Ethne to reach all nations. We thank you for the work they're doing in, in helping to train missionaries to be uh, um, uh, to, to go to the other most parts of the world, especially mm -hmm. Muslim areas of the world, Lord, and share the good news of Jesus Christ. So we ask your blessing on them and on their son, uh, Juan Jose. And Father, now as we turn to studying your word, we again would ask for open hearts and open ears and open minds. We ask that you would fill us with your spirit. We thank you that your word is living and active. And uh, we pray, Father, that you would impress your word on our hearts today, that as we study it, uh, you would uh, help us then to apply it and to obey it and to live it. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we continue our study in the book of Philippians today, we are going to be looking at Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 through uh, 11. So I encourage you to uh, take your Bibles now and follow along as I read those verses. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who worship by the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus, and who do not put confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence." If anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. 
What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. My main thought today as we look at this passage is that uh, it reveals two important facts to us about true righteousness. The first one is that true righteousness is not found in anything that I have done, am doing, or will do. We see this in verses 1 through 6. And uh, in verses 1 through 3, we see that true righteousness is not found in obedience to the law of Moses. Now Paul begins this passage with, with the word finally. And it's a reference to the final matters that he wants to share with the Philippian church. It's not necessarily uh, introducing the conclusion of the letter, but just the final matters that he wants to share with them. And he tells them, first of all, to rejoice in the Lord. Remember, that's the theme of the book of Philippians. Rejoice in the Lord. But the in the Lord part is an important part of that rejoicing. We are to rejoice in what God has accomplished for us in Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ is everything to a true Christian. He then goes on to say, It's no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Uh, Paul had apparently written to them before regarding being on their guard against false teachers, and especially those who would seek to add obedience to the law of Moses as a requirement to become full members of the covenant people of God. Uh, there does not appear to be an immediate threat of these false teachers in Philippi. Uh, by the way, these false teachers were called Judaizers, um, uh, there, but there doesn't appear to be a, a, a immediate threat of them trying to influence the believers there in Philippi. But Paul knows it's likely only a matter of time. He tells them to watch out for those dogs. This is an interesting phrase. Uh, Paul sarcastically calls these Judaizers dogs. Now he's taking a slur that the Jews used against the Gentiles and turning it back against these false teachers. It referred to the packs of wild dogs that used to raid the garbage and eat everything that they could find on the streets uh, in the uh, ancient uh, Near East. And since the Gentiles were not concerned about clean and unclean foods or about purifying themselves according to the Jewish rituals, the Jews viewed them just, just like those unclean dogs. So the Jews used it as a slur uh, against the Gentiles, saying that they were dogs. Now here Paul turns the tables on these Judaizers and calls them uh, dogs. He says, watch out for them, uh, those men who do evil. He calls these men who prided themselves on their good works evil workers. They thought they were obeying God's law. Outwardly they were good, moral people and zealous for religious activities. But their religious works were evil in God's sight because they took pride in their own achievements and trusted in their own good deeds as the means of making them part of God's covenant people. Such trust in human works brings glory to man but it nullifies what Christ did for us on the cross. So in, in fact, they thought they were doing good, but in fact it was evil because they were not accepting God's salvation, which comes to us by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Uh, and he calls them mutilators of the flesh, which is a play on, on words. You see, in Greek, circumcision, the word for circumcision is peritome, and Paul calls these men katakome, mutilators. Just as the pagan priests of Baal in Elijah's day cut themselves in a religious frenzy, so these false teachers were mutilating people through their emphasis on circumcision. They wrongly thought that the, uh, by the removal of the male foreskin, uh, that, that, people, that that was the way people became part of the covenant people uh, of God. But as Paul argues in Romans 4, even Abraham, by whom God first gave, uh, or to whom God first gave the right of circumcision, was not made right with God through circumcision, but rather through faith. 
Now today there are many professing Christians who believe they must obey various aspects of the Mosaic Law in order to be accepted by God. Some of these things include Sabbath keeping that were required to worship on uh, Saturday instead of Sunday. Uh, some of this, re, uh, this emphasis on the Mosaic Law among believers today is the, the food laws, uh, clean and unclean, and they think that they're still under those laws, and they, they put themselves under those laws. And, and even tithing uh, are just a few examples of how uh, believers today place themselves inadvertently under the Mosaic Law. The problem with that is if you put yourself under any part of the Mosaic Law, you're obligated to obey all of it. And the Mosaic Law was never meant to save anybody. It was meant to show people our sinfulness and our need of a Savior who came in Jesus Christ and established the New Covenant. They forgot, these folks, these Judaizers, these false teachers, forgot that they were now under the New Covenant. And so Paul emphasizes some aspects of the New Covenant next in his argument here. He says, we are the circumcision. In Colossians 2, 10 through 11, Paul writes, You've been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. In him you were, circ were also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with a circumcision done by the hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ. You see, uh, circumcision under the New Covenant is a circumcision of the heart, where the old sinful nature is peeled away. To use the terms that we talked about in our study of Ezekiel, God has taken our heart of stone and made it a heart of flesh. This is what Paul is referring to when he calls true Christians the circumcision. It's a spiritual inner work performed on us by Christ, and it's part of the New Covenant. Um, Another aspect of the New Covenant, he says, is uh, we who worship by the Spirit of God. Jesus said God is Spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. True worship is the inner sense of awe and gratitude and love for God that stems from an understanding of who God is and who we are in His presence. The false teachers were making worship a matter of outward ritual. Paul is saying that true Christians are marked by inner worship prompted by the indwelling Holy Spirit. The Spirit works submission in our hearts so that we bow before God, caught up in love and praise, giving all glory to Him for His great salvation. And he adds another aspect of the New Covenant when he says, you know, we are the ones who glory in Christ Jesus. Uh, Paul is basing uh, this statement on Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24, where it says, This is what the Lord says, Let not the wise boast of their wisdom, or the strong boast of their strength, or the rich boast of their riches. But let the one who boasts boast about this, that they have the understanding to know me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For in these I delight, declares the Lord. Have you ever been around a boaster? Uh, he or she goes around telling everyone how wonderful he or she is, how smart he or she is, how much he or she knows. Christians are to go, uh, should go around telling people not how wonderful they are, but how wonderful Christ is, how great he is, how merciful, how kind, how powerful, how awesome, how righteous he is. And then Paul says again, uh, as part of the new covenant, we put no confidence in the flesh. Our lives either consist of boasting in the Lord and what he has done for us, or boasting in the flesh, which means our own efforts to achieve righteousness and acceptance by God. The two are mutually exclusive. Uh, they're incompatible. The Judaizers put confidence in the flesh, in these outward rituals like circumcision, thinking that's what made them, or, or was the final step in helping them to become part of the covenant people of God, and they were saying that's what the Gentiles needed to do, not only believe in Jesus, but put themselves under the Mosaic Law. True believers glory in the Lord Jesus Christ and in His work on their behalf. We also see here in verses 4 through 6 that true righteousness is not found in human merit. In these verses, Paul plays the devil's advocate for a moment. 
and he talks about, you know, if you want to talk about putting confidence in the flesh, let me tell you, I've got more uh, uh, things to my account to, to put uh, confidence in the flesh if you want to, uh, if you want to put, fle uh, uh, put confidence in the flesh. I, I've done more to achieve righteousness and acceptance by God by the things that I've done. So if you want to look at that ledger page, you know, let me share with you uh, what my ledger page looks like. And then he goes on to talk about that he was Jewish through and through, that he had been circumcised on the eighth day, that he was of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, which meant he was someone who had dedicated his life to studying the law of God, the uh, law of Moses, and codifying it and seeking to live by it. As for zeal, he says, I was persecuting the church. He was, he, he saw before he became a believer in Jesus Christ, he saw Christians as a threat to, to Judaism. And he was persecuting them and traveling from place to place uh, to root them out and to, um, to uh, put them in prison and to, to have them uh, persecuted. Uh, he, he says, uh, as for legalistic righteousness, he was faultless. And by that, it doesn't mean he was perfect. But when you looked at the Old Testament law and what the Pharisees were doing with it, they were codifying it so that, you know, they could live outwardly by the various aspects of the law. And in their mind, they were faultless. They were perfectly righteous before God. Um, typically, that meant they were obeying the food laws and they were observing the special days that the, uh, the Old Testament law called for. Well, these... Um, First six verses emphasize that true righteousness does not come from anything that I have done, am doing, or will do. I cannot earn it by my efforts. Uh, so many people today are trying to earn their way to heaven by their good works, by their good moral behavior. And as I've said before, that doesn't cut it in God's eyes. Nobody can live up to God's standard. True righteousness does not come by, uh, you know, what I have done or what I am doing or what I will do. We cannot attain it in our own strength and our, our own, you know, willpower. It just cannot happen. Uh, Paul goes on then to say in this passage in verses 7 uh, through 11 that true righteousness is found in knowing Christ. After outlining, outlining why he would have reason to put confidence in his own efforts to achieve righteousness and acceptance by God, Paul now states that he considers all of those things on his ledger page that he would have considered, um, you know, his efforts to be morally righteous, he considers them rubbish, he considers them a trash uh, for the sake of knowing and gaining Christ. True righteousness is found in knowing and gaining Christ through faith not having a righteousness of my own that comes through con obedience to the Old Testament law. That's what Paul is talking about. Now the goal of the Christian life is to know Christ. Not just know about Christ, but to know him in a personal experiential way. Jesus said the same thing when he prayed, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That's a quote from John chapter 17, verse 3. Christianity is primarily a growing relationship with the infinite God who has revealed himself through the Lord Jesus Christ. As with all relationships, it begins with an initial meeting or introduction. And in Paul's case, it was not a planned or pol polite introduction that he had to Jesus. Uh, he was on his way to Damascus to persecute Christians uh, when he... Uh, you know, when he had this a vision of the glorified Christ, he was blinded by this vision. And uh, he, he hears this voice calling out to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he answered, Saul did, who, uh, you know, who are you, Lord? And Jesus said, I'm Jesus whom you are persecuting. So it's that, at that point, that Paul had a personal encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ, and we can assume at that point he put his faith and trust in Jesus. And knowing Christ means accepting by faith his sacrifice for our sin. Becoming a Christian requires that you know some things about Jesus. You need to know who he claimed to be, that he was eternal God in human flesh. You must know some of the things that he did and taught. You need to understand that he died on the cross for your sins and that he was raised bodily from the dead. 
But beyond these facts, you need to know Christ personally. That relationship begins the moment you recognize that your sins have separated you from God and that you need a Savior. You also realize that you cannot save yourself from God's judgment through your own efforts or good works. Letting go of all human merit, you call upon the Lord to be merciful to you based on the merits of the death of His Son, Jesus. Your object of trust for commending yourself to God shifts from yourself and your own efforts to achieve righteousness to Christ, and um, then you are saved. You have met Jesus Christ personally. Uh, there's a Bible verse that says uh, that we talk about as the, the great exchange where God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So when we meet Christ personally, when we put our faith and trust in him and his death on the cross for our sins, we are giving him our sin and in return we are receiving the righteousness of Christ. Now when God looks at us, he no longer sees our sinful nature, he sees the righteousness of Christ, the blood of Christ. Uh, covering that. Like any relationship though, once you've met, you must cultivate that relationship. God has revealed himself to us through his living word, Jesus Christ, and his written word, which we have in the Bible. We need to spend time regularly reading his word and applying it to our lives with the help of the Holy Spirit, so that we become more and more like Jesus in our thoughts, our attitudes, and actions. Knowing Christ also, Paul says, means experiencing the power of his resurrection. What does he mean by that? The, you know, the experiencing the power of the resurrected Lord. Well, Paul came to know the power of the resurrected Lord when he was struck down by that blinding vision of Jesus on the road to Damascus. Even though not all conversions are as dramatic as Paul's was, all conversions require the same mighty power of the risen Lord Jesus Christ because they all require God to raise the sinner from spiritual death to spiritual life. That's what it tells us in Ephesians chapter 2 verses 4 through 6 where it says that we were dead in our transgressions and sins and God made us alive through his spirit. That's the resurrected power of Jesus Christ at work in each one of our lives. Other scriptures compare conversion to opening the eyes of the blind so that they can turn from darkness to light and to delivering the captives from Satan's domain to God's kingdom. Uh, these are not things that can be accomplished through human persuasion or through a self-improvement program. They require the same mighty power of God that raised Jesus from the dead. That same resurrection power is necessary to sustain the believer as he or she walks in victory over sin. And Paul prays for the Ephesians in chapter 1, verses 19 through 20 of Ephesians, that they would know, quote, what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe, which is in accordance with the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead. He prays for these same Christians that God would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. In Romans 8.11 he explains, But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal, mortal bodies through his spirit who indwells you. He means that the Holy Spirit, whose power was necessary to defeat Satan by raising Jesus from the dead, indwells every believer and uh, gives us power over the indwelling sin in our own lives. We experience power as we walk moment by moment, yield to and in dependence on the indwelling Holy Spirit. If we live a defeated life, it's safe to say that we're not living in dependence on the Holy Spirit. We must learn to live experientially in the power of Christ's resurrection. Your life can be transformed. We can experience the power of the resurrection now. Not only the moment we put our faith and trust in Jesus, where we are made alive, we've been spiritually dead and now we're spiritually alive, but now our lives can be transformed. We are not stuck with indwelling sin. The Holy Spirit can empower us to have victory over that sin so that we become more and more like Jesus. We're not going to be perfect. We're not going to be perfect. That's not going to happen until we die and go to be with Jesus. But we can overcome these indwelling sins slowly but surely and become more and more like Jesus because of the resurrection power that is at work within us. 
Knowing Christ means sharing in the fellowship of his sufferings, Paul says as well. Our Savior came to suffer for our sins on the cross, and his entire ministry was marked by misunderstanding, by opposition, by betrayal, and then finally death. While we can never enter into Christ's sufferings in the same way that he suffered on the cross, there is a sense in which we can never be like him if we do not go through suffering and learn to entrust our souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. Hebrews 5.8 makes the startling statement that Jesus learned obedience through the things that he suffered. Now, it doesn't mean that Jesus was disobedient and had to learn to be obedient through suffering. It means that he had never experienced the test of obedience until he suffered. His suffering for our sins on the cross was the ultimate test of his submission uh, to the will of the Father. If we're going to be like him, we must also learn to obey God through suffering. Unlike Jesus, we have the powerful force of indwelling sin to contend with. God uses suffering to burn off the dross and to purify us. But we have to cooperate with him by humbling ourselves under his mighty hand when we go through trials, trusting his sovereignty over our suffering and casting all our cares upon him because we know he cares for us. Knowing Christ also means dying to self. Uh, Paul describes it by becoming like him in his death. Uh, Paul describes in many other places the idea of dying to sin and self through the cross of Christ. When we trust in Christ, the Bible says that we are placed in Christ which means that we are identified with him in his death and resurrection. But we have to live experientially what is true of us positionally. So positionally, when we trust in Christ, we are placed in Christ. We experience through Christ his death and resurrection. But now we need to live that out experientially in our lives. Paul states, I've been crucified with Christ. This is from Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and delivered himself up for me. In Colossians 3, 5, just after explaining how we have died and been raised up with Christ, he exhorts us to put to death the members of our body, uh, bodies with regard to various sins. That is what Jesus meant when he said that whoever, fo who whoever follows him must deny self take up his cross daily, and follow him. Jesus also lived by denying temptations to live in his own power for his own ends. He lived only to do the Father's will, and that to the degree that we learn to die to self and sin and be conformed to his death, then the same degree, in that same degree, we will grow to be like him. And so, to be like him in his death, to be fully surrendered to the Father, to, um, to, to realize that, you know, I, uh, through the Spirit working in me, I can die to that old sinful nature and I can display the fruit of the Spirit, display the character of Christ. Finally, Paul says that knowing Christ means looking forward to a resurrected life in heaven. In verse 11, Paul's referring to the future resurrection of the righteous at the return of Christ when our mortal bodies will be transformed into the likeness of Christ's resurrection body, free from all sin. We will then share in his glory throughout eternity. Now Paul says, he uses that phrase, if somehow I may attain to the resurrection from the dead, and that's led some people to think Paul was uncertain about his own resurrection. I don't think that's the case. We have plenty of verses, including all of uh, 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul uh, talks very confidently about the resurrection of the dead. So what does he mean here by this phrase, if somehow? Um, I think it, it, it's rather, he's uncertain about the manner in which he will attain the resurrection of the dead. In other words, whether he may still be alive when Christ returns and he's resurrected at that point, or uh, he might die. Remember, he's in prison writing this letter and he hasn't faced trial yet, but one of the outcomes of that trial could very well be that he is killed. Um, that he faces capital punishment for his crimes. So he's uncertain about how he's going to uh, reach that point of resurrection from the dead, but he's not uncertain about the fact that he will. Knowing Christ gives us a great future 
to look forward to. Well, let me just try to sum up what I've shared with you in this message today. True righteousness is not found in anything that I have done, am doing, or will do. True righteousness is found only in knowing Christ, putting our faith and trust in what he has done for us on the cross, and then experiencing that empowering, transforming presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So let me ask you, do you know Christ in a personal way? Not just do you know about Jesus, do you know some facts about him, but do you know him in a personal way? Have you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? And then are you experiencing the transforming power of his resurrection in your life through the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit? Or are you trusting in your own moral goodness, thinking that's what's going to get you to heaven? Paul has stated very clearly here that that is not going to cut it. Good people, simply good people, do not go to heaven. It's those who acknowledge their sin and their need of a Savior and put their faith and trust in Jesus and then receive the righteousness of Christ that are going to heaven. So please, please don't put your faith and trust in your own moral goodness. It's bankrupt. It does not provide true righteousness. True righteousness is found only in knowing Christ in that personal way, putting your faith and trust in him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this word. Thank you for this reminder. We've heard this message before, and Paul even states that, that it's no trouble for him to, to say the same thing over and over again. It's no trouble for me either. It's so important that we get this right. So, Father, I would pray that if there's anybody listening today who is trusting in their own moral goodness and their own moral righteousness by the things they have done, are doing, or will do, thinking that that is what's going to gain them acceptance into heaven, please convict them by your Spirit and show them that is not the case. The true righteousness is only found in Jesus Christ, and by putting our faith and trust in Him, and as a result of that, we experience the empowering presence, transforming presence of your Holy Spirit in our life to, to change us so that we become in our thoughts, attitudes, and actions more and more like Jesus. Thank you for our salvation in Christ. Thank you for uh, the, the, the righteousness that we gain from Christ. And thank you that it's all by grace through faith, that there's nothing we can do to earn it. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's receive the benediction. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.